Okay, so hello everyone. Um, welcome to this year's email security talk at USNIX. So my name is Jens Müller, I'm a PhD student at the Chair for Network and Data Security at the University of Bochum in Germany. And uh, this is joint work with the University of Applied Sciences in Münster as well as independent researchers on spoofing PGP and SMIME signatures in emails. Let's get straight into the subject. So what you can see here is a screenshot of a PGP signed message in Roundcube, which is a popular open source webmail client. Take yourself a second and ask yourself what could possibly go wrong if we present the results of signature verification to the user like this. So remember we are in HTML email, that my client. And also the signature is shown in the email body itself, which is an attacker controlled UI element. So what an attacker needs to do is basically uh, spoof that uh, green uh, bar and the, the logo using HTML email. Okay, so obviously that's a really lame attack. So how did we make it to Usenix? So uh, <laughs> we did not only attack some, some uh, UI requesting, some presentation attacks, also we, we attacked the interpretation and, and the parsing of, of uh, the underlying data formats of um, PGP and SMIME signatures. Um, however, I know this is the crypto session, and I know you will be disappointed now. <laughs> We're not going to attack the actual crypto, okay? We are not going to, to factor large numbers or whatsoever. However, it may be an interesting example of what can go wrong if developers implement crypto. Okay, so here's the attacker model. So our attacker Eve, she can send a spoofed, or she can send an email to the victim, and also she can obviously set arbitrary uh, header data. So she can, of course, set the from header, okay? So one reason why you want to use digital signatures in email is to get sender authenticity, which standard email doesn't have, okay? Um, and for some of the attacks, Eve also um, may already have obtained um, an already signed message by the victim to be impersonated and use it in a different context. For some of the attacks, she may also have already have had previous communication with the victim. Okay, um, so basically what we do is we attack different layers of email. We divided our attacks into five classes. You already saw simple UI redressing, targeting how the results of signature verification are presented to the user. Um, also, we target the missing binding of the signer's identity to the sender address derived from the email header. Um, we have some interesting mime wrapping attacks where we attack the body of the actual email, and we have a deeper look at how KnuPG, for example, processes the PGP signature format as well as CMS, which is the container format used by YesMime. Okay, let me give some examples for each class of attacks. So, um, uh, yeah, first of all, of course, the first three attacks, they, are work, uh, they target PGP and SMIME, and, and the last two are specific for, for PGP or SMIME, obviously. Now, let me give you an example for UI redressing. You already saw that uh, simple Roundcube example. So, uh, what the attacker can do is he can look at the source code, what Roundcube does, for example, uh, if it wants to inject HTML to display a valid message. Uh, copy that HTML code, compose a new message uh, with that HTML code, but change the actual message and therefore easily, super easily uh, spoof visually indistinguishable emails. Okay, that obviously works in the context of HTML email because a lot of people, for whatever reason, they want fancy formatting in their emails and therefore email clients, they support HTML, CSS, embedded images, and so on. And unfortunately, a lot of um, email client vendors they display the results of signature verification in the email body, which is um, an attacker-controlled UI element. Okay, um, which is kind of natural if you want to implement a, a third-party PGP plugin, and also kind of intuitive because actually it's the body that's signed, it's not the header. Okay, the next class, oh no, <laughs> the, the countermeasure um, that was applied by, for example, by Enigma, which is the default uh, PGP plugin for Thunderbird, is um, to move the security indicators out of the body, like moving it up there, uh, which yeah looks a bit weird, but probably should be fine. Uh, next class of attacks targets the missing a binding between the signer's address and the sender's address. Okay, so um, assume our attacker Eve, she would simply sign an email under her own identity using her own private key, and then spoof the from address, and then assume the receiving email client would simply display. Oh, it's a valid signature, but it wouldn't say signed by whom. So, okay, it's super important, of course, to know by whom the message was signed. So, 
About half of the email clients we tested, they explicitly show the email address derived from the signature from the certificate, and then let the user decide if that's okay or not okay. And the other half, they do it different. They show something like, well, trusted sender address. How do they do that? So let's have a look at the SMRC. The SMRC states that receiving email clients, they must check that the address in the from or sender header of an email matches the email address derived from the certificate. Okay, yeah, fair enough. So if we develop an email client, we could simply check and compare basically if this uh, signer's address is the same one than the one in from, right? Easy. Unfortunately, in practice, it's not that easy. Like there's, for example, display names, okay? So we can only check if it is contained, which makes our regex much more complicated. And, and also, uh, a lot of email clients, they, uh, they tend to show only the display name, okay, not the email address. So we can already set this to someone else. We can even set an email address to the display name. If an, um, an email client shows both the display name and the email address, like Outlook does, for example, there are a couple of Unicode tricks. Or what about just adding a bunch of new lines? And therefore, we are going to cut the actual email address out of the display, okay? This is an email that is actually signed by uh, Eve and um, GPG for Outlook, the, the Outlook uh, PGP plugin basically verifies that the signer's address is the sender's address, but actually what is shown by Outlook is only the manager at work.com address. Okay, and, and there are lo lots of other uh, header play tricks, like you can add yet another from header, you can add another sender header, and very often the verification logic of email addresses, the comparison logic is another one than what is actually displayed. Basically, of all those clients who did this comparison, only one was bug-free, okay? It's, it seems to be super hard to, to implement that in a secure way. Okay, so um, the main cause is obviously that functional features like send and from address, they have become security relevant nowadays. And as a countermeasure, of course, we can explicitly show the signer's address somewhere in the UI to the user and delegate it, um, the decision back to the user, which may or may not work. Okay, um, so the next class of attacks is uh, mime wrapping. So uh, we attack the email content. How does a signed email look like? Now this is uh, a signed email sent by Phil Zimmerman in 2001 over public mailing lists. We are reusing that signed message and wrapping our own content around it. We can do that, it's totally valid, my mail. Okay, supported by almost all clients since 20 years. But we have now two parts, we have the signed text by Phil and we have our own parts. And popular email clients like Lab Apple, Apple Mail and, and Thunderbird, they simply show both parts, but they see that oh, one part is validly signed, so let's just draw the bar for a valid signature, okay? So it says greetings, Usenix. So all we need to do now as an attacker, we need to somehow get rid of Phil's text being displayed, okay? So what about adding a bunch of uh, new lines, okay? Just cutting it out of the display. What about defining the second part as an attachment, okay? It's still parsed, it's still validated by the verification logic, but it's not displayed anymore. We can also embed the second part within the first part as an image. So um, the second part is not really an image, so it's not displayed, but it's still verified by the verification logic. Again, the green part is displayed, even so we get completely rid of Phil's original text. Last but not least, we can also simply comment out the second part. Okay, there's a lot of uh, variants, as you can see, but the main cause, obviously, is that a lot of email clients, they um, show a valid signed uh, email because they only have this one bar, even so only a part of the email was actually signed. I think this is because um, forwarded emails should not be invalidated, and also mailing lists, which tend to add some footer, they often invalidated messages, so, so email clients got more and more relaxed, which is bad. Uh, what can you do as a countermeasure? You can explicitly show, of course, which part is signed and which is not. I think this is super, super hard to implement securely. So uh, also you should not do this in the email body, okay? Otherwise you're again vulnerable to UI redressing. Okay, so we recommend using an all or nothing approach. So do not show an email as validly signed unless the whole email, the whole MIME structure is actually signed. Okay, um, now let's look at the actual um, signature data format used by PGP. So if you have a PGP signed a PGP signature, 
it usually consists internally of a literal data packet, which contains some metadata like the, the format, optionally a file name, a timestamp, and a lot of other information. And a signature packet, which contains um, a fingerprint and, and the actual signature data. Now, a lot of email clients, do, they rely on CNUPG um, to do the actual verification. Okay, CNUPG is the factor standard PGP implementation. So, you need to know that CNUPG is not a library, it's actually an executable. Therefore, email clients, very often they call CNUPG on the command line. CNUPG parses that uh, incoming signature, verifies it, and then outputs to standard output um, information about the signature. And then uh, email client plugins like Enigma or GPG tools for Apple Mail, they grab basically the output for certain strings like GoodSig. And if that string is contained, they display a valid signature. What could possibly go wrong? So um, have a look at the metadata, like the file name. So what if we simply inject something in the file name? What if we uh, call the file name GoodSig? Okay. And so, this email doesn't even contain any signature. It only contains a literal um, data packet with a file name, and yet it's um, reflected by CNUPG, parsed by Enigma mail and a GPG tools for Apple mail, and then again, a, a valid signature is displayed. Okay, so, um, and there is a bunch of other texts that are related to CNUPG. You can find them in the paper. Okay, obviously it seems to be super complex to securely call CNUPG. It's not, not super easy for developers to do. There's a lot of attacker-controlled input fields in the PGP data format, and when we tested it, not all of them were correctly sanitized. Also, of course, client parses are a bit too relaxed on when to show a valid signature or not. Okay, so the last class of attacks is um, based on CMS, the cryptographic message syntax. It's the container format used by SMIME. So um, there's a lot of edge cases in, in CMS. You can find them in the paper. I'm just giving one, one example here now. So um, one of those fields in CMS is the encapsulated content field, which contains the actual message to be signed. Um, fair enough. So this is one of the data formats uh, one of the signature formats supported by SMIME, it's opaque signatures. Now, a lot of email clients that do not support SMIME, they cannot show, they cannot display the actual message. So therefore, people very often choose to use another um, format supported by SMIME, which is detached signatures. Um, in this case, the e-content is an empty string, and the actual message to be signed is in the first part of a multi-port signed message. Okay, we have those two signature formats in, in the SMAM standard. Clients need to support both of them. Now what happens if we combine both of them, okay? What happens if we have captured a message from Phil Zimmerman or whoever um, with uh, an e-content string and then we add a detached signature around that? So the worst thing that could happen here is that the email client verification logic actually verifies against the e-content in the CMS data object but displays the outer, the outer, uh, the detached uh, message. Uh, and actually, that's what iOS Mail and, and Thunderbird actually do. Okay, so um, obviously CMS is super flexible. There are a lot of edge cases and, and they are not actually discussed in the security considerations of the SMIM RFCs. Um, so a lot of things can go wrong here. If you're a developer of a mail client, if you're in doubt, do not display any email as, as uh, validly signed. Okay, so now we evaluated those attacks on 25 popular email clients, basically every client where support for either PGP or SMIME is available. And for a lot of clients, we already get something we call perfect forgery, uh, meaning that the spoofed messaging is visually indistinguishable from, from a real one. And as you can see, there, there are multiple forgeries for the major clients. And then for some email clients, we could spoof um, signatures, but we could not spoof them on all layers of the UI. So if the user clicks on the details, he will, he will see that maybe this message is actually signed by Eve and, and not by the manager or whatever. Um, so this is still, of course, kind of vulnerable. Okay, this is not good. And then for, for some email clients, we could not generate pixel identical copies in our forgeries, or we have 
we could not forge all UI elements, okay? So, for example, simply UI redressing in um, Enigma and Thunderbird, uh, we cannot actually forge those UI elements, so uh, we do not classify those weak forgeries as vulnerable. But it's obvious that it's not perfect either, okay? Okay, so uh, last slide. So um, let me come to a conclusion. So we um, finally were able to forge signatures, meaning perfect or partial forgery on 70% of the tested email clients, um, among them major clients like um, Outlook, Apple Mail, Thunderbird, and others. And um, both PGP and SMIME, they're equally affected. Um, so we, we targeted the underlying data formats, the signature formats of PGP and SMIME, but also a lot of standard email features like MIME mail, okay, like HTML email, like the missing, um, the missing bind of the signer's address to the sender's address, and so on. Which uh, kind of brings me to the final question, is it even uh, possible to build security on, on top of email? I think this is really, really super, super challenging. Okay, so we reported all those issues to the affected vendors. I, I hope they have patched by now. And if you want to test your own email client, all the test cases are available on GitHub. Thank you. Okay, we'd love to take some questions and please come up to one of the mics. So do you have any specific client recommendations? In, like, what should we be using? Or, or is the third bullet point just like, oh god, we should, like, oh, don't know, don't use anything? Heaven is falling, so on email. So, um, well, I mean, there are specific countermeasures, of course, for all, all those kinds of attacks. Keep it simple, keep it stupid. Gloss mail, for example, they do a good job. Uh, like, do not have HTML email. Do be very conservative on, on when to thread um, signatures as valid well and, and things like that. Still, I, I think as long as things are based on email, it's, it's really challenging. So you need to be really, really careful, um, especially if you want to be compatible with other users who may have certain features enabled. Thank you. I really like the part of the paper where you said that there were some GPG attacks that went past email. And so I'm wondering if you can explain some of the um, attacks that affect things like Yarn and, and other aspects even beyond email clients? Well, we didn't really have a deep look, actually. But um, of course, uh, yeah, KPG is not only used in the context of email. It's also used in the context of uh, packet managers, OK? Uh, Debian, for example, all the packages are signed with uh, KNUPG and a lot of other um, packet, package managers that basically rely on, on KNUPG. And yeah, it's, it's just, also, again, it's, it's really hard to do that in a, in a secure way. Um, but yeah, that's in the additional findings in the paper. For, so for the details, please refer to the paper. It's also kind of future work, I think. Uh, we, we will still go a bit into that direction and have a deeper look into packet managers. Yeah. All right, let's give our speaker another round of applause. And thank you. <laughs> <laughs>